Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, I am Irene. Uh, today I will be discussing my paper, Rethinking Political Representation, uh, which I developed uh, in a period of research I carried out at the Italian Institute of National Statistics, which I then followed up with independent research to produce my master's dissertation at the LSE. I will be mainly addressing two broad questions. First, is the traditional measurement for gender equality in political representation a valid instrument of this radical concept? And second, how does changing the measure of this concept modifies our perspective on the determinants of gender inequality in political representation and following the policy response to this issue? But let's start by giving a definition of political representation. I will be using the definition of Pete Keane, one of the most prominent scholars of the field, and I will focus on the last two definitions, so descriptive and substantive representation, as these are the most relevant one when uh, talking about uh, underrepresented communities in politics. So descriptive rep representation is defined as the compositional similarity between elected politician and their voters. So in other words, how similar are elected politicians and voters demographically. Substantive representation, on the other hand, considers how well voters' interests are defended by the actions of their representatives. In particular, I argue that the traditional measure of women political representation as a number of women in elected uh, political bodies is limited at, as it only accounts for descriptive representation. Moreover, this measure also carries some uh, important theoretical implications as for example, the idea that only politicians who share their gender identity with constituents can represent their inter interest. In other words, only women uh, politicians can represent women. The choice of a number of women in politics as measure of political empowerment is dependent by the assumption that descriptive representation leads to substantive representation. However, uh, there are mixed theoretical evidence and term empirical evidence on this. I also tested this hypothesis in, in my paper empirically, and I indeed find a correlation between the two concepts, uh, but I could not identify any casual relationship between the two. Thus, feminist scholars in general are moving away from the use of unidimensional indicators as number of women in politics um, and looking for more comprehensive measures. And in particular, I make a methodological contribution to the field. In fact, I developed uh, a new index called the Gender Political Representation Index, which combines uh, descriptive and substantive representation. Uh, in the paper, I also apply this newly developed index to the investigation of whether systems with higher level of proportionality tend to be associated with more gender equal political representation. But let's dig into how I practically constructed my index. So the index is composed of two sub-indexes, one accounting for descriptive representation and one accounting for a substantive representation. First, the, um, the oh, I'm not able to access my video. Okay, hello. <laughs> uh, so first, the, a descriptive representation subindex uh, is composed of the traditional measures of gender equality in political representation. In particular, the subindex is uh, constructed taking the weighted average of share of women in national parliaments, in the European Parliament, in government, and in regional assemblies. Data is taken at the national level between 2003 and 2020. Uh, but then there is the more compelling question of how to measure substantive representation. So going back to the definition, as you recall, substantive representation uh, consider policymakers' actions toward defending the interests of their constituents. But then there is the question of which are the interests of uh, gender-based communities. So traditionally for women, we see that these interests are identifies, uh, identified as childcare, education, women's health, or parental leave policies. However, as you are now trying to understand gender as a more comprehensive uh, variable, um, and in particular as a multi-layer system, we can think that gender uh, produces interest at the individual, meso, and macro levels. So going beyond the traditional policy areas that are addressed as 
feminine. Hence, considering only the most politicized gender interests, such as childbearing, family, and labor policies would be very limited. Thus, what I do to overcome this issue is that I account for gender mainstreaming practices. What is gender mainstreaming? Gender mainstreaming is an institutional practice derived from the assumption that every policy area has gender implication. And as such, it impacts asymmetrically people identifying with different genders. Thus, the practice of gender mainstreaming the impact of gender in, pol in the policymaking process for every policy area, not only the ones that are traditionally considered uh, women's interests. So uh, in practice, what I do to construct the substantive representation set index is that I take the weighted, weighted average of three indicators uh, accounting for gender mainstreaming practices in the European Union developed by the European Institute of Gender Equality. In particular, these indicators account for whether there is an institutional body uh, measuring uh, responsible of gender mainstreaming practices in the member state and the uh, resources and personnel allocated to these um, institutional bodies. So uh, the, the index aggregates these two, two sub-indexes, so the substantive and uh, descriptive representation ones, using the adjusted Mazzotta Pareto method. Uh, this methodology allows for the aggregation of non-substitutable factors, uh, which is a very statistical term, but uh, anyway, this means that the aggregation methods that does not assume that the two sub-indexes are co compensatory, meaning that a higher score in one of the two uh, cannot substitute for a lower score in the other. So in practice, the methodology does this by assigning a penalty to those countries for which the two sub-indexes are very heterogeneous. The final outcome is um, a score ranging from zero to 100 given to each countries. The higher the score, the more gender equal uh, is pol politics in the country. So overall, the, this new index, the gender political representation index that I developed, complements the traditional measure of gender equality and political empowerment with gender mainstreaming practices. Uh, this allows to account for, sub, for substantive representation as long as with descriptive representation without confining gender-related interests to childcare family policies or the ones that are traditionally uh, viewed as women's, women's issues. And this allows in turn for a more comprehensive understanding of gender as a multi-layered system. But let's look at the results and performance of every country in the uh, European Union in 2020 for the Gender Political Representation Index. Uh, we can observe that uh, Scandinavian countries tend to perform better uh, and this result is in line with other measure of uh, gender equality in the European Union as the gender equality index. But one important exception that I would like to point out is Denmark, uh, which does not uh, perform as well as other Scandinavian country. In fact, uh, Denmark only ranks 23rd out of the 28 countries considered. Another important country, uh, important country that I would like to point out are Austria uh, that perform really well in 2020 and Portugal alongside with Spain which uh, are third, fourth, and fifth. Looking at the trends of the gender political representation index over time, these are only some of the countries considered. Uh, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, compared to um, the descriptive representation, so traditional measure for which we see an upward trend in for many countries, there is a downward trend for the over time for the gender political representation index. Uh, this can be explained by the fact that despite more and more women enter politics, substantive representation um, and in particular gender mainstreaming practices tend to decrease over time in Europe, for many European member states. I would also like to briefly discuss the first application of this newly developed index. I wanted to assess if countries with more proportional electoral systems tend to have high, uh, more gender equal political representation. In fact, uh, gender uh, mainstream literature tends to agree on the positive association between 
proportional system and female political participation measured in the traditional sense as a share of women in political institutions. And I wanted to see if these results are robust for the new measurement of gender political representation index. Uh, I perform a cross-country regression analysis of electoral system to assess the relationship between electoral system and the uh, GPRI. And what I find is that my results are in line with uh, previous literature on the topic, meaning that in particular, a fully majoritarian system, as you can see from the graph, uh, scores on average nine points less than a country with the maximum value of proportionality. I also tentatively uh, identify average district magnitude as potential explanation for this, but further research will address this question more thoroughly. Finally, I wanted to highlight the main limitation of my methodology, which is that the gender political representation index is intrinsically bound to the definition of gender and gender mainstreaming given by the European Union. What does this mean? Uh, in other words, that um, even if the methodology of the gender political representation index uh, would potentially allow for non-binary definition of gender and broader um, definition of gender, uh, in fact, the, the index for the moment is still frames gender as a binary variable, and it will be do it doing so as long as the European Union defines gender as binary. Uh, this is due to construction of the of the index and how, uh, in particular, gender mainstreaming practices are uh, measured. This paper also uh, points out the some policy implications, and in particular, how the unidimensional indicators, so number of women in, in politics, oversimplified understanding of gender inequality in political representation. And this in turn leads to limited policy response. In fact, the gender quotas that are the main policy response to political underrepresentation in the EU, while being necessary for the achievement of descriptive representation, are not sufficient to tackle the uh, underrepresentation in terms of substantive representation. Moreover, uh, as the traditional ranking of gender inequality in political representation has been questioned uh, by the newly developed index, uh, best practices derived from the countries with highest num number of women in political bodies should also be revised in light of these countries' levels of substantive representation. So to conclude, uh, overall, the gender equality representation index allows for uh, to account for substantive representation in the measurement of gender equality uh, without confining gender related interests to child childcare and family policies or uh, the policy areas that, which are traditionally considered more feminine. And as we've seen, this is not only a methodological contribution, but this also carries important implications uh, pointing to the limits of the policy response of the European Union uh, dealing with gender inequality in uh, political representation. Uh, so that will be all. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I will be welcoming questions and comments in the uh, Q&A later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. Okay, we're going to move straight on to our next paper. Over to you, Anne. Thank you very much. So um, I just wanted to say before starting that uh, although uh, I have my name alone on the program, it doesn't actually represent the team that was involved in the work that I'm going to be presenting today. So it's just uh, part of a much wider project than just myself. So I wanted to uh, acknowledge my colleagues, and you can see their names uh, on the slides here and the associate technical papers that uh, we've been writing on this. Um, so this, uh, the work that I want to present today is uh, uh, part of uh, a wider program of development of gender indices. And this is work that uh, we did in collaboration with the UN Women and the uh, UNDP. And it's completely inscribed to the wider development of gender indices at that level since 1995. So in particular, we're responding to the development in 1995 of the first gender diversity, uh, sorry, the gender development index and the gender empowerment measure. 
We are responding also to the criticisms that were made following the development in 2010 of the Gender Inequality Index and so on. And we see many, many developments in later years when it comes to uh, gender data and the creations of dashboards and responding to particular issues in relation to gender equality. So we see, for example, in 2020, the Gender Social Norms Index, but we also see uh, the creation of a lot of dashboards, particularly on issues such as uh, gender and COVID-19. Uh, the work that we've been doing here is really to think about what new gender indices were needed uh, to take advantage of new data that were kind of becoming available, but also to set a new agenda in terms of the global measurements of gender inequalities uh, in a global perspective. So this is work in progress, as I mentioned, but I will show you where we're at in relation to the construction of the new measurements. So we are responding to criticisms of the Gender Development Index, and uh, in particular in this, this, this is the construction of the GDI. And we can see that some of the problems from a gender perspective were, for example, the measurement of life expectancy. The fact that uh, men and women are just facing inequalities there with men living less than men so than women so being disadvantaged but this doesn't take into account the fact that women get sicker although they live longer it also has a number of problems with data coverage and a lot of controversies around the use of uh, standards of living and income variables uh, when they are disaggregated by sex so with a low coverage of the data, for instance. When it comes to the GII, the Gender Inequality Index, here a lot of criticisms as well. Two of the main ones being that it mixes uh, absolute and relative measurements. So in health, the fact that we are mixing adolescent birth rates, for example, which is considering only women versus other measures that are looking at the relative positions of women compared to men. And then the second criticism of the GII being the, the very complex functional form that it has, and that makes it actually quite difficult to understand and to communicate to stakeholders. So what we have been proposing is a, a new uh, gender equality and women's empowerment measurement framework. We have created a set of twin gender indices, one being the Global Gender Parity Index and the other one, the Women's uh, Empowerment Index. So this improves on the uh, global indices that have been created before by in increasing not only the uh, dimensions that are considered, but also what is included within those dimensions. So if you look at the global gender parity index, uh, you see that it is looking at uh, the relative status of women compared to men. It's looking not only at life, but also good health. It is extending the concept of education to also take into account skills building and, and knowledge, so for example, involvement in employment and uh, educational possibilities beyond formal education. It's looking at labor and fin financial inclusion. So not only the formal uh, labor market, but also the, the ability, ability of uh, uh, financial mechanisms. And then finally, participation in decision making in this at different level, not only in just political representation, but also local government uh, and uh, also in uh, management. Uh, one of the things as well, if we mirror the measurement uh, of the dimensions in the two uh, gender indices, with the exception of an additional dimension, which we see as very, very important for the measurement of gender equality in the Women's Empowerment Index, which is uh, including uh, data on freedom from violence, and in particular here on intimate partner violence. So to uh, talk a little bit about the added value of those twin indices, uh, first is the fact that the twin indices allow us to look at the relative gender gaps and the absolute levels of women's empowerment at the same time, yet separately. We're also creating measures that go beyond just mortality and life expectancy and uh, to include issues of morbidity and good health and uh, re responding to a lot of uh, literature in this topic for uh, the measurement, the global measurement of gender inequalities. We keep with the tradition of gender indices to focus on capabilities. This is very much aligned to human 
human development approach of the last 20 years and more. Uh, but we're moving where possible, subject to data availabilities, to enhance capabilities. So, for example, not only looking at uh, primary education, but trying to just go a little bit beyond that. Uh, we are, for the first time, including a proxy of the time spent in unpaid care activities. Uh, as you may know, this is one of the main criticisms of gender indices, is that it doesn't actually uh, take into account the measurement that we have of the distribution of time between women and men. And what we have here is an indicator that is looking at labor force participation, but for couples that have uh, young children in the home. We have made an inclusion of a local government indicator for political representation. And of course, the inclusion of the gender-based violence indicator for the Women's Empowerment Index. One thing also worth mentioning that I will show you uh, later when I look at the empirical results is that we are responding to the need to look at the heterogeneity among women. And what we've started doing, although we've been quite constrained by data availability, is to provide a quintile disaggregated uh, women's uh, empowerment index to just show a little bit more nuance in the measurement uh, that was possible. And then finally, we have been looking at promoting progress on all fronts simultaneously. And this means from a technical point of view, ensuring that the dimensions that we take into account are aggregated using a geometric mean to uh, try and uh, limit compensations between different levels of inequalities. So I'll show you a bit of empirical results uh, of uh, these twin indices. First, the, the methodology in three steps for the Global Gender Parity Index. We start by creating gender gap ratios for each indicator. So this is based, of course, on global data sets. So we are very constrained by the binary approach to this and looking at uh, female over male as proxies for women over men. We create a dimension indices using the geometric mean for each one of the sub dimension. And we aggregate that uh, at the level of an index using the geometric mean. So if you look at each of the four dimensions of the Global Gender Parity Index, you see that most of the time, the red line is the uh, equality point between women and men. Uh, most of the time, the uh, results for the countries are below that. So most of the gender gap favor men. Uh, we see good variation in the majority of indicators with the exception of the health component. This is uh, something that is typical of uh, data on health and is a feature of uh, many of the gender indices. We looked into this quite a lot and we could not find any other approaches. So uh, this is just really a feature of uh, the distribution of, uh, of variables and indicators in that domain. So this is the empirical results uh, for the overall global uh, gender parity index. We have a measurement that uh, is possible for 156 countries uh, globally. And you see here a distribution of scores, which go from a little bit below 0 0.3 to uh, close to one. So one being uh, the uh, closest point to equality. We've been looking a little bit at how uh, this um, index was behaving, so a little bit of sensitivity analysis here in relation to human development groups. So you see that if you split it by uh, human development groups, there is a slight tendency uh, to have uh, higher scores or uh, higher levels of uh, human development. However, what is interesting here is there's quite a lot of uh, variation within each of the categories themselves. So it is not the predictive power of uh, human development groups in relation to uh, the uh, global gender parity index is not terribly high. For the women's empowerment index, we follow a similar methodology. Uh, we uh, have something that is slightly different because we ensure that all our indicators are normalized and, uh, between bounded between zero and one or point in the same direction as a precondition. We then aggregate the dimension index uh, indices using the arithmetic means as opposed to the geometric one. And then finally aggregate at the level of the index using the geometric mean. Again, if you look at the different dimensions, this is how the different indicators are behaving. So 
uh, they vary considerably across countries, but overall we have something that is well balanced and uh, the, the correlation structure, which I'm not showing here, also uh, behaves very well. The uh, Women's Empowerment Index is calculated across 156 countries again, and ranging uh, from 0 0.2 to 0 0.9. I, we did the same exercise of looking at the distribution of the Women's Environment Index by Human Development Group. And here, compared to the first uh, figure that I showed, we see a, a much uh, steeper relationship when it comes to the groupings on the, the human development. Uh, so it is very clear that there is a direct relationship between, between the two, and that usually having higher levels of uh, human development are associated with uh, higher uh, ranks when it comes to the uh, Women's Environment Index. What we did is uh, we tried to go beyond those national averages and uh, we wanted to disaggregate the data wherever possible by uh, income quintiles. And uh, we did that across a smaller section of uh, countries across only 110 countries. We also had uh, a lot of issues with finding the uh, data, uh, the, the available segregation. And we were only able to do this for four out of the 10 indicators that uh, we use for the Women's uh, Empowerment Index. So it's very important to stress here that we're very much underestimating uh, the true empowerment inequality across those 10 quintiles. But what is very interesting to see here, and you see it in the figure, is that across the 110 countries for which we've calculated this, we see a pretty consistent pattern of uh, the, the highest quintiles have got across the board uh, a higher scores of the Women's Empowerment Index compared to the lowest quintiles. And then finally, uh, in the analysis that we're doing, we're trying to relate back to those twin indices and to see what they're telling us when we put them together. So here you can see a scatter plot, which is uh, uh, plotting the, the global gender parity index against the women's empowerment index. As expected, we have a very strong correlation uh, between the two. And uh, this is something that we want to pick further to understand better how those scores are going to be allowing us to say a little bit more. So as I said, this is very much a work in progress. Uh, we uh, are uh, refining the analysis and uh, a lot of the concepts and uh, the measurements as it is. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor and actually get a bit of feedback to the work that we were doing uh, in a setting like today. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Okay, everyone's keeping the time beautifully. So we'll move on to our third paper. Susanna and Wendy. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you um, to the organizers um, for, for having us and everyone else for your attention. Um, so I will be presenting um, uh, a paper that is also a work in progress um, and that we are working on um, together with, with Wendy Sigal, who is um, also here. Um, so we're going to be talking about leave policies for fathers today, which have been gaining attention from both policymakers and researchers as promising as a promising solution to inequality of men and women um, in the division of paid and unpaid labor. Um, and researchers have been asking how to design policies to encourage leave taking, and then also um, do these policies um, actually change the gender division of paid work and care. And to contribute to these debates, we are focusing on a new leave policy introduced in Slovakia in 2011 um, that we find presents an interesting case. At a first glance, the policy ticks the boxes of best practice. It offers fathers a daddy quota um, of six months that is well remunerated and not transferable to mothers. At the same time, it is our understanding that the policy was introduced accidentally 
It was intended for adoptive parents, but written in a way that covers all fathers. This means that parents couldn't expect this policy, um, reasonably couldn't expect it, and they couldn't adjust their behavior accordingly, for example, by postponing pregnancy and birth to, to benefit from the more generous policy as compared to what was in place before. And so this manner of introduction sets the policy up for investigation as a natural experiment, um, which may be of interest to researchers who are seeking to isolate um, the effect of policy on parents' behavior with all else held equal. Um, Grounded in positivist science, researchers have been intent on understanding and isolating causal effects of such, such policy on behavior um, for a long time. In the world of evidence-based policy, um, a randomized control trial would be seen as a gold standard. Um, in the absence of RCTs, researchers aim for um, quasi-natural experiments, um, such as difference in difference approaches. At the same time, researchers aim to pin down the crucial indicators of successful policies. Um, and both causality and these crucial indicators um, can be linked to the idea of generalizability and transferability of such best practice policy. So if we have a policy identified by crucial indicators that has been proven to work in one context, it is often assumed that it can be transferred to other contexts as well and that it will have similar effects. By contrast, uh, feminist approaches to policy analysis um, have questioned to what extent effects of policy on behavior can be isolated and to what extent such findings are transferable across contexts. While much positivist quant research on leave uptake by fathers assumes that gender plays a role in shaping parents' decision-making, it is typically conceptualized and or um, operationalized as an individual property. So as fathers or mothers, general attitudes. And so it's seen as separable and um, additive um, as a factor shaping uptake. By comparison, um, Barbara Risman's conceptualization of gender as a social structure suggests that reducing gender to a gender binary in this way is just too thin. Um, rather, Risman argues, gender is a structure that shapes parents' decision-making through processes on multiple levels, including, yes, um, on the individual level, for example, through gendered identities, um, but also on the interactional level, um, through gendered um, cognitive patterns and pattern um, um, images and patterns that we um, encounter in the everyday, but also on the institutional level through um, gendered policies or gendered norms. Um, so in this way, Rizman's conceptualization also draws attention to the fact that gender varies greatly over time and space. Um, and this conceptualization also problematizes um, the assumptions that I mentioned earlier, that it is easy or indeed possible at all um, to both isolate the effects of a policy innovation such as Paribus and um, also to extrapolate from one context to another. So, as already mentioned, we find that this new Slovak leave policy presents an interesting case to think about the differences stemming from these two approaches. Um, due to its features and the accidental manner of introduction already mentioned, but also due to the unique gendered context um, into which it was introduced and that is likely to shape its uptake and moderate its effect on behavior. First, um, the policy, uh, the uptake of the policy may be affected by its framing um, and the associated discourse. So likely due to the manner in which it was introduced, this policy was not implemented with an explicit intention to enhance gender equality and um, corresponding official, official discourse was lacking. Unlike in other contexts where the goals um, were clearly set and communicated. <clears throat> 
This void in Slovakia um, was filled only later by a prominent politician who publicized the policy. Um, but rather than emphasize gender equality, he drew attention um, to an option to work, continue with paid work on leave, which I will uh, mention shortly in more detail. Moreover, the policy was introduced into a context with pre-existing gender norms um, and uh, policies and practices of leave sharing. Um, mandated um, by the norm of threeness, um, which has been um, coined by Steven Saxenberg, um, the ideal mother in Slovakia is expected to stay at home with children until the age of three, making use of both well-paid maternity leave and poorly paid parental leave. In 2012, 60% of Slovaks thought that paid leave uh, should be taken entirely by the mother more than anywhere else in the OECD. And at the same time, fathers in Slovakia are expected to provide financially rather than stay at home. Um, in 2014, almost half of Slovaks thought that fathers should prioritize uh, careers over childcare, again, more than anywhere else um, in the EU. And finally, uh, work on leave. Um, the policy was partly modeled on pre-existing maternity leave policy, and it turned out that this policy had allowed mothers and now also allows fathers to continue with paid work uh, while on leave. And this can be done with no administrative obstacles if uh, parents are self-employed. If they're employed, it can be uh, done when on a new contract. So, for example, in a new position or uh, working for a new employer. It is unclear whether this was intentional or not likely not. Um, but there was never evidence that mothers continued with paid work while on leave, or at least not in great numbers. And we'll see that with fathers, this turned out to be quite a different story. Um, and so we set out to investigate how informative and generalizable a case study of the Slovak policy might be. We aim to highlight the methodological implications of the gender structure framework, and we consider how the estimates of its effects can be interpreted when drawing on these two different research approaches, positivist and feminist. And so we ask two research questions. Um, what are the patterns of leave policy uptake by fathers in Slovakia? And in what way um, may these patterns have been shaped by the specific unique gendered context? And um, we use a unique administrative data set of all fathers eligible for leave um, in Slovakia from 2011 until mid-2019. And we carry out a descriptive analysis of the uh, pace um, of uptake and um, work on leave while drawing comparison with findings from other contexts where similar policies were introduced. So um, despite its best practice features, uptake of the policy in Slovakia has been relatively slow, starting from 0.2% um, um, the first um, year after its introduction and reaching only projected 23% uh, of fathers taking leave compared to the numbers of children born in 2019. Um, this is eight years after the introduction of the policy. Um, by comparison, in Germany, uptake of leave by fathers rose um, from 3.5% in 2006 before um, the German well-remunerated debt quota was introduced um, to actually 34% seven years after the introduction. And in Norway, uptake grows even faster, starting from 4% in 1993, when a daddy quota was introduced to already 25% in 1994, just a year later, and um, to quite staggering 85% in 2007 years later. Um, if these patterns, so if um, in Slovakia were leveraged as a quasi natural experiment, the relatively slow uptake observed in Slovakia could be um, interpreted as evidence that demand for this kind of policy um, is lower than previously thought based on case studies from these other countries. However, in these other countries, the respective policies were publicly debated. Parents uh, could reasonably have anticipated their introduction and so could have adjusted their behavior accordingly by postponing pregnancy and birth to make use of the new, more generous policy. Um, and this could have led to a biased estimate or an overestimation of the effect of the policy on behavior. 
by contrast, leveraging uh, the gender structure framework offers a different interpretation um, that draws attention to the gendered context, how the policy was framed and communicated in Slovakia as opposed to these other countries. Um, so both in Germany and Norway, policies were explicitly aimed at the redistribution of paid and unpaid work and were communicated accordingly, which could have contributed um, to this um, faster and higher uptake. By contrast, in, in the Slovak policy was not accompanied by any such discourse. At the same time, um, the slower initial uptake in Slovakia could also be explained with the help of the more prevalent traditional norms on uh, leave sharing and men's workplace participation. Um, and in addition to the slow uptake, a high proportion of fathers continued with employment while on leave, either part-time or full-time. In 2018, almost 45% of leave-taking fathers did some paid work. In 2019, almost 29% did. Um, though the policy design allows both men and women to combine leave with paid work, media reports suggest only fathers have done so to the point um, where the government started pushing back against such use of leave by denying fathers um, a leave if they found they were um, working. And here, a positivist approach that looks to identify best practice policy by means of standardized indicators and um, leave take both may be less attention to important policy characteristics like the work on leave option, um, which nevertheless greatly modifies the effect of the policy on leave sharing behavior. Um, by contrast, um, a feminist approach pushes us to pay attention to the specific details and what they may mean in a specific context. So the gender structure framework may help explain the popularity of the work option in Slovakia, while in a less or differently gendered context, the work option may have remained little used. Um, again, work on leave may be shaped by the associated discourse. Um, the rise starting from 2015 um, coincides with media reports on the previously little known policy, uh, where information on the work on leave option was also publicized. And the drop in work on leave in 2019 coincides with news reports on the responsible agency pushing back against full-time work on leave. And at the same time, the gender norms that mandate mother's care and father's paid work can also help explain why even fathers who do take leave continue with paid work. In summary, we argue that our study illustrates the importance of questioning positivist approaches to investigating the relationship between policy and behavior. But we also believe this suggests um, there are significant limitations to what quant research can tell us about understanding uptake of leave by fathers. And we argue for the use of qualitative research to get a better understanding of the role of context in shaping policy uptake. Um, Thank you um, very much. Uh, that's it from us for now. And uh, we will be uh, very happy to um, answer any questions you might have and are looking forward to your feedback. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna and all our presenters. And we'll now hand over to Joseph, our discussant. Good morning or good afternoon, whatever time zone everyone is in. Uh, my name is Joseph Van Mater, and I am a PhD candidate at the Department of Sociology at Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. Um, and I have been very grateful to have the opportunity to spend some extra time with these papers prior to today, today and to have a chance to speak about them briefly. Um, I have about 15 minutes allocated to my time. And um, while I love the sound of my own voice, I don't think that there's any reason that y'all should love it too. Um, so what I'd like to do is spend just a few minutes highlighting um, what I saw as some of the overlap among these papers and some of the areas of strength that they have. And then um, just pose a couple questions um, to the authors and then turn the floor back over to them um, to continue that discussion. Um, and just as a note, my comments here are based on their extended abstracts and the full papers. So it may touch on a couple areas that weren't um, explicitly part of the presentations um, that they gave today. So um, looking at some of the main themes or rather um, main comments that I'd like to make. Um, the first is um, 
I want to highlight the way that all of these papers interrogate um, what I'll call the underlying data of each of the um, areas that they're studying. Each of these papers do a very good job of thinking through and making explicit um, what's going on under the hood in terms of the data that they use. Um, Irena, uh, for example, spends quite a bit of time in her paper talking about the non-compensatory nature of the two sub-indices that she includes in the Gender Equality Representation Index. Um, so it's not an add the way that she um, includes on the two indices isn't additive, but rather um, there's a penalty that's included uh, for having kind of a distinct um, or a, a larger difference um, between the two sub-indices. Um, there's also a really great conversation about the trade-offs between conceptual completeness, complexity, and the avail availability of um, data within um, Susanna's paper. Um, there's a lot of indexes that are out there already, the Human Opportunity Index, um, you can, any country has their own statistical methods that they use. Um, but I think both of these papers do a really good job of thinking about measurement and the trade-offs that we have to make as researchers when creating um, these kinds of um, indices to engage in data reduction of some variety. Um, and then Anne's paper takes a slightly different angle and as really argues for broadening the outcome measures um, related to gender-specific outcomes. And the core of her argument, as I understood it, um, is that mechanisms are important, which isn't um, a brand new idea, but I think what she does really well is explaining and arguing that mechanisms are important and they can be gendered in and of themselves, um, and that we should really move away from the, um, simple reduced form estimates estimates of, um, did it work? Did it not work? What's the magnitude of it working? Um, and be more cognizant and specific about the gender specific mechanisms that are implicated in causal impact analysis. So I think that's one area that they um, overlap and did a really good job um, thinking about in all three papers. And the second area that I wanted to talk about um, is um, really avoiding epistemological dead ends. Um, looking at um, um, Irina's paper, um, these are kind of very simplified, oh, yep, these are kind of very simplified um, <laughs> diagrams, if you want to call them that. Um, but looking at Irina's paper, there was a, the idea of gender mainstreaming as a structural change, which could lead to better representation that could have a better policy outcome. Um, thinking about Susanna's paper, um, having better measurement of um, women's empowerment and women's experiences can lead to better theoretical understandings or again, better policy outcomes um, within and between countries. Um, and then also looking at Anne's paper, um, really reducing the reliance on um, so-called best practices, a term that I also um, really dislike, um, and focusing on local context can um, lead to better policy outcomes and um, better implementation. Uh, and these all have a goal-oriented attitude, I think the papers do, in seeing some sort of better outcome. Um, and that seems like an, um, an obvious idea of having a research objective. Um, but I think, um, or what I find in a lot of um, otherwise very thoughtful criticism of empirical work um, in and around gender, sexual orientation, sexuality, um, it'll often start out by pointing out issues in prior work um, and then end with some version of um, everything is irreducibly unique. We can't generalize and we can't really take um, there's no way to um, apply conclusions to another context, um, which is obviously an exaggeration, um, but often in the uh, criticism that I see of empirical work, it can lead to um, epistemological dead ends or dead ends um, that don't point to a way to create and apply new knowledge. And these pap papers um, all offer uh, critical assessments of prior work and prior methodologies but they don't end in 
obligatory individualization or hyper individualization. Rather, they provide momentum um, in their respective research areas by offering constructive ways forward. Um, two of them by providing refined measures um, and one of them calling for much clearer understandings of um, gendered mechanisms and causal research um, and thinking about ways that um, we can do that. And so I really applaud them in looking for ways forward um, within a quantitative um, framework. And so with that said, I'd like to pose a couple of questions that any of the authors um, can take a stab at, and I will turn it back over um, to um, the moderator here in a moment. But the first question is, um, when we have influence over data collection, and often we don't, um, as was described in the plenary session earlier, um, which part frontier should we push harder on? Um, where should we um, try to exert our influence when we have it? Um, and to that point, what kinds of data collections would have made the biggest difference for your individual papers um, or the individual research that you're working on right now? Um, where do social, cultural, or attitudinal change fit into the research framework? Um, and how can we measure that in cross-country indices um, for at least two of those papers? Um, and the third question, if anyone wants to take a, um, a stab, is how can we um, how can people with trans and non-binary gender identities be included in these measurement frameworks? Um, that's something that we were talking about earlier in the plenary session as well. Um, but explicitly, um, especially in the context of multidimensional frameworks for and cross-cultural studies. Um, so with that, I will um, turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you so much. So many thanks to you all, especially uh, presenters, of course, and the discussant for a great session.